Accepting God's love. Have you ever thought that whenever you don't accept God's love, you're actually sinning? Whenever God says that He loves you and you say, ah, I don't think so, or I doubt it, that that's as big a sin as when, you know, you lie, you talk bad about someone, or you steal, or, or uh, you're living a life of drunkenness, or you're, you know, whatever it might be, kind of the things we typically think of sin. You know, it's just as bad to disobey God when He says, I love you and I want you to receive my love. In fact, I think the two are very related because we're trying to defeat those ugly things, that ugly part of us. Are you aware that that's in you? I hate that, don't you? There's this brokenness inside of us and instead of bringing, admitting that and bringing it to God, we want to hide it from God. And we say, no, 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 God, whenever I, get this, whenever I get my act together, when I get cleaned up, then I'll have something good to present to you, then I'll come to you. But God says, no, I already, well, you don't think I already know about those things. You bring those things to me and together we will clean those things up. And I think it starts with this basic foundation that God loves you. God loves you. Amen. And I know you're saying, oh, are we talking about that again? I said, yeah, and if you'll get that, we can move on to other things. At the same time, there's something in us, and one of Satan's most insidious tools is that tiny voice, and it sounds a lot like my own. It says, he can't love you. There's no way he could love you. I want us to read our first scripture together. It's one you may have memorized. If not, if you know nothing else about the Bible, this is a great place to start. If you know everything about the Bible, this is a great place to come back to. Read it with me. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God so loved you. Now I'm about to say some things that you are thinking, and you have to follow me, I'm kind of I'm drifting in and out this morning, about basically I'm going to have the argument that you're already having in your heads. So I'm about to begin with something that you're already thinking as we're reading that. Did you hear me say God loves you and God loves the world? You're thinking, I believe that, David. I believe that God loves the world. But I'm not so sure that He loves me. Wait a minute, David. We have this deal, remember? We come to church, you read what God says, we nod, pretending to believe, and we go home unchanged. But now you're going to call me out on what's going on in my head. We come to church, you read what God said. You tell us about God's power, we go home and try to live on our own. You tell us about God's peace and joy, we return to our anxiety and struggle. You tell us about how Jesus came to fix our relationship with God, we go home and further destroy our earthly relationships. You tell us about how we are secure in God, we go home and act fearful, threatened, and ugly out of our insecurity. I told you the story about Duck Church, right? I watch almost no television, but the other day, Jonathan and I were watching, uh, what's, what's the Duck Show? Dynasty. Duck Dynasty, thank you. The Duck Show, that was the title that got rejected. And so if you don't know what Duck Dynasty is, basically, were they from Alabama or somewhere like that, right? And Louisiana. And, and so they're hunters through and through. They wear camouflage. I'm sure if they showed up to church in a suit and tie, it would be camouflage. And in watching that, it reminded me of Duck Church. Maybe you've heard this story. There's a church and only ducks go there and the ducks will waddle in every Sunday morning and the duck preacher will stand up and he will tell them with the greatest inspiration of quacks about how God created them to fly and they can soar. And there are stories in the book of ducks that, that talks about ducks migrating miles and miles each year from places where they live, get, live during the winter to places where they live during the summer. And that you were made, look at the wings you have, and God created you to fly, and they all quack, amen, and then they all waddle home. <laughs> I've already decided about what God feels about me. Don't bother me with scripture, is what we often say. And I know that for every scripture I read showing you that God loves you, you have several reasons why it can't be true. I'm actually not going to read a lot of those scriptures this morning. One, there's so many it would take an hour. 
Second, you've probably heard most of them. And quite honestly, I don't think that me reciting them to you is going to penetrate today, so if it hasn't penetrated over the last many years. If you really want it, go get it. What I want to do instead is to loan you some glasses, some new eyes, so that when you go, when you want it, when you might be thinking, maybe that crazy preacher's right, and you go searching for it, that when you see, you actually can see. The reasons why we can re rebut most of what God says about loving us basically fits into one category. We hear this phrase, God loves you, and you say, I don't think so. And the reason I know that is because I know me. And I think I know God. I know me. And I think I know God. Matthew chapter 22. An expert in religious law and teachings comes to Jesus and asks, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Luke adds strength. This is the first and greatest command. You should pay attention to that. One, because Jesus said it. Secondly, because he's saying this of all the commands that maybe we're, we're taught to obey, and obedience is important, especially when we can, can tie that with the love for God. He says the first thing is love God with everything that you are. Then he says the second is like it. It's kind of a two-for-one deal. See, he asked Jesus, what's the one most important? He says, I'll give you two. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. Love others the way you love yourself. To be real honest with you, I hope that you treat others a little better than that. We hate ourselves, and that maybe that's why we hate others. We don't forgive ourselves, maybe that's why we don't forgive others. We beat ourselves up, so we beat others up. We judge and condemn ourselves, so you get the point. But technically we can say, I'm obeying what Jesus said. You see, we can't give God's love until we get God's love. We can't respond with God's love and loving other people until we have responded to God's love. It all starts with the love of God. See, I can read the verses to you, but God's word seems to be no match for your human logic. I might throw out a verse about biblical truth and you break out the jujitsu and can deflect it with the greatest of skill. And though we believe these truths in our minds, our minds have knowledge that our hearts know nothing of. I can declare God loves you. And at the release of those verbal arrows of truth, you immediately deploy your shields as if to prepare and deflect them, lest any of them graze your heart and land and find a place to stick and cause you to wrestle with this struggle that you have about, but I know me and I know God and how one could love the other is beyond reason. God can't possibly love me. Much to joy, the joy of Satan, we protect ourselves from God's love when God's love is the only thing that can set us free to empower us and to obey Him. If you want to avoid wrestling, I'm going to give you some hints here. Okay, you know, usually I try to give you two or three things, steps that might move you in the right direction. But I'm, I'm with you here, so I'm going to try to give you two or three pointers on how to avoid letting God's love land and affect to change you, alright? Because like, apparently that's our goal. So I'm going with it. If you want to avoid wrestling with God's love for you, you have to keep your guard up, especially at church. It's one of his favorite venues to try to tell you that he loves you. Now most of us come knowing that. That's not true at every church, but you probably figured that out about yours. So when you come to church, keep your guards up. 
Outside of church, guys, is sneakier. 